I'm Dr. James Murrow. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm a professor of psychiatry and neuroscience at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. I'm also the director of the Depression and Anxiety Center for Discovery and Treatment. So mood and anxiety disorders are a broad and actually very common group of psychiatric disorders. Uh, mood disorders encompass both depression and also bipolar disorder um, and anxiety disorders can cover things like panic disorder, uh, generalized anxiety disorder, uh, something called specific phobia. This could be like a severe fear of spiders or flying. And altogether, uh, mood disorders and anxiety disorders uh, encompass a very large uh, a group of um, conditions that a uh, psychiatrist might treat. One thing I always like to point out is that mood disorders and anxiety disorders, uh, like all psychiatric disorders, these are brain diseases, okay, uh, uh, similar to neurological conditions. And although our scientific understanding is still somewhat limited and we don't fully understand the brain basis of all psychiatric disorders, I think it's important for patients and their families to realize that these are conditions um, that come from their brain. Um, and a lot of our treatments, be it behavioral, psychotherapy, medications, and others, are aimed at correcting what we understand as what might be going wrong uh, in the brain. Um, so for example, take depression, probably the most common a mood disorder. Uh, depression is thought to account for more disability than pretty much any other disease, um, particularly in young adults, even things like cardiovascular disease. Uh, so this is a very large burden. Um, brain imaging studies and other things show that when individuals are in a depression, their brain is not functioning, functioning normally. Um, so for example, the parts of their brain that generate emotion and in particularly negative emotion are uh, hyperactive, okay, for example. So they might light up on a functional brain scan. Um, and then the parts of their brain that are more responsible for reasoning um, critical thinking are actually underactive. Uh, so these are, we, are things that doctors and scientists can see uh, using different types of, for example, brain imaging technology. And this aligns with uh, uh, patients that come in and they'll say, um, I feel sad all the time and I don't know why. And at the same time, I can't think clearly. I can't plan and understand. Um, sometimes I can't remember what people tell me. And the accumulating brain science, you know, maps onto that. So we're learning more and more about the brain basis of depression and other mood disorders. The essential feature of mood disorder um, is the individual's mood, not surprisingly. Okay, so people can feel positive, negative, but the mood has become, their emotional state has become disconnected from the environment and it no longer seems to function in an adaptive way. And a very common uh, scenario is people feel down, sad, depressed, okay? That's their mood. And we call it a mood disorder because they feel that way most of the day, uh, every day, for weeks and weeks or months and months. And that's in fact part of how you make the diagnosis. So if this is happening to you or a family member, you know, or a doctor may be asking you questions. And if it turns out you feel down, sad, um, and it doesn't seem to be connected to, for example, um, you may be going through different stressors in your life, but even if things get better, you don't feel better. That's one of the things that we're often trying to figure out to say, is this a mood disorder? So something like depression, someone feels down, depressed, most of the day, nearly every day for weeks or months. Um, and it comes along with a host of other changes. Um, one would be lack of motivation. They feel that even if they want to do something, they just can't, or even small tasks seem to require a huge amount of effort. Even basic things like hygiene, brushing your teeth before bed. Um, often individuals come to clinical attention or come to a doctor or they're brought in by their family if they're having trouble getting out of bed and they're not meeting their basic role obligations, like they can't go to school or they can't go to work. Um, these kind of things that are sort of practically uh, impacting their day-to-day -day life is often the tipping point when someone would come in um, seeking treatment. 
So with depression, uh, we know a lot about risk factors. Um, so we know illnesses like depression tend to uh, strike individuals either in late teens or young adulthood, uh, which is part of why they're associated with so much disability. Because just when someone is sort of getting their life together, maybe they're going off to school or starting a job or family, then and they kind of get knocked off course, it can be hard to get back on. Um, so there are risk factors uh, like age and, and, and things like that. Uh, we're learning more and more about uh, genetics. We know that the more stress an individual has in their day-to-day -day life, or if they've suffered some major trauma or loss, um, those are risk factors. Uh, so for example, there are studies showing the more, the more stress an individual is exposed to accumulate over their life, the higher the risk that they'll go into a depression. Now that being said, it's not always a one-to-one -one connection. So some people can live very stressful lives, but never develop a depression. And others can develop a depression and there's no clear sort of stressor or trauma. So in that sense, there's a lot we don't understand. When we do biology studies like brain scans, we can see systematic differences. If you take individuals with depression and not, for example, um, having an imbalance in different parts of the brain um, between the part that generates emotion and the part that is responsible for higher thinking and memory. These seem to be disconnected in depression or not in a, an optimal balance. Um, but again, often we don't know the causes. How did the person's brain get into that state? Um, I mentioned genetics. It does run in families. Um, we see that. At the same time, if you ask the question, what are individual genes that cause depression or can I do a genetic test to see if I'll get depression? Um, we're not there yet. So although there's um, an overwhelming amount of evidence that depression and other psychiatric illnesses are brain disorders, there's still a lot we don't understand about their fundamental causes. If, you know, someone or, or family member thinks they're maybe suffering from a depression. And again, the number one thing is just the individual isn't acting like themselves, doesn't feel like themselves, um, is, is sort of down, fatigued, uh, lack of energy in a way that's not typical for them, then that's, that's a red flag that um, they should seek help. So there are lots of ways to do this. Um, often the easiest thing is to talk to your, if you have a primary care doctor, um, primary care doctors, are uh, very good at identifying depression. Um, they do a lot of uh, treatment for depression with medications and other things, um, or a psychologist, counselor. Often people don't know where to go, so often turn into a you know, family member or friend just to seek advice, what should I do? But ultimately try to get to a professional um, uh, healthcare provider such as a primary care doctor, um, a psychiatrist, or um, a therapist. Yeah, so I mean, really the goal of the, the Depression Anxiety Center is to advance a, a treatment in this area, uh, ultimately discover new treatments, um, discover what are the causes of depression uh, and related conditions such as anxiety uh, or trauma disorders. Um, and we really do this in two ways. We use technology to understand the mechanisms or the biology of these illnesses so we can use different types of brain scan technology. These would be things like MRI or what's called functional MRI of the brain. We can also use techniques where we can measure uh, proteins and genetic information in blood cells actually uh, to get an indication of what might be going on in depression or other mood disorders. So for individuals that are suffering from these illnesses, um, we work with the clinics and the doctors and we invite them to participate in some of these studies so that in parallel to them getting the treatments, we can learn about the biology of these illnesses, for example, following them over time, looking at changes in their blood markers or brain or other aspects of, of biology or behavior. Some of the things we do is, you know, right now, when a doctor is evaluating how someone is doing, say on a treatment for depression, um, they may be asking systematic questions to understand, are they getting better? Uh, is their mood getting better? Is their activity levels getting better? Um, we try to augment that with things like computer-based tasks where someone might be playing a game where they can win a reward and we're looking at how they're performing in that and can that give us a more unbiased measure of their reward capacity, 
uh, other technologies, for example, with smartphones to look at their movement and, and patterns. And we hope that this technology in the future will be useful for diagnosing um, and um, treating depression. So we have those types of studies in the center, what I would consider kind of mechanism, understand the fundamental causes, how can we better diagnose mood and anxiety disorders. And then we run clinical trials and clinical trials are essentially testing new interventions. They could be uh, computer games, they could be different types of drugs or medications or other things, different types of what's called neurostimulation technology. Um, and that's really the way ultimately new treatments get to patients is there's an initial studies in small groups of volunteers to see if there's a signal, if a new type of treatment could be helpful. Um, and that's really where we spend a lot of the time in the center.